Hey homesteaders, gardeners, and cooks. My name is Jennifer. Welcome to Miles Away Farm. I thought I would do a bit of a early June, first of June farm tour or garden tour. I actually have two gardens. One of them is a small personal garden with some raised beds where I grow herbs and a few things that I just use for the household. And then I have a second, much larger market garden where I grow produce that I sell and also produce that I dry or turn into some other kind of value added product. And so we'll go look at both. Come join me. This is my green stock because like everybody else on the planet, I succumbed to the appeal of a green stock. And right now the bottom part of it is planted in strawberries and the top part of it is planted in sweet peas that are just coming up. The sweet peas went in a little bit late, so we'll see how they do, but I have fantasies of them cascading down this and being very pretty. The strawberries are a ever-bearing strawberry and I don't have great success with strawberries in this green stock. They do okay, the plants do okay, but in general, I don't end up with really large fruit. Um, this is actually pretty typical. So I don't know if it's a lack of fertilizer or what exactly. Um, I do have problems with birds stealing the fruit. And then also this guy, Bodie, who really loves all strawberries. And so if I don't keep it netted, he has a tendency to come in and help himself to any ripe strawberries that he can reach. But not huge berries, so I don't love this system. I've had better luck growing strawberries in the ground, but it's, it's an experiment, we'll see how it goes. I have flowers throughout the gardens. This is a calendula, and I have four different varieties in here. This one is just starting to bloom. They are so fun, I just love them. They're so happy and cheery. This is almost entirely an herb bed, so we have Flat leaf parsley, marjoram, which I use in an Italian seasoning mix that I make, za'atar, which I use in a fresh za'atar mix that I make, which is related to uh, oregano and marjoram. It's kind of in that same group. Some basil, some Thai basil, some holy basil or tulsi, some cilantro, which I'm primarily growing for the seed, which is coriander. Um, cilantro is really a winter crop and it comes up very quickly in the spring and then bolts and I'm just going to let it do its thing. So I might harvest a little bit of this, but mostly it's going to be for the seed rather than for the green growth. Some dill and then this is celery and my plan this year is to harvest and chop and freeze enough celery that I have celery for all of the winter months. I don't use a lot of celery. I'm not somebody who eats it raw, but I use it a lot in stews and soups and things like that in the winter. And so I'm hoping to have enough, and I should have plenty. There's six plants in here, which is way more than I actually need. Um, I've grown celery before. It's kind of a fun crop, but one of the problems that I have with it is it has a lot of nooks and crannies and I have a lot of earwigs. And so I end up with all kinds of damage to the stems because the earwigs get in there and think it's a great hidey hole and chew on it. But we can cut around that, so we'll see how we do. This bed is not fully planted yet. It's going to be flowers primarily and some okra. Okra is a very late season crop. It needs to be quite warm. And then I have um, zucchini, two patty pan squash and another zucchini and then in the arch trellis, we have beans on either side. So I have scarlet runner beans here. And this is a Sri Lankan long bean that I picked up at a seed swap. I've never grown these before. The one time I tried to grow long beans before, they all just got eaten by different things. And I got like three beans out of the entire crop. So I kind of gave up. I never actually got a chance to eat them. This is getting clearly getting chewed on by something. I do have slug issues, and so I just keep putting slug bait down in here. And all of my decorative pots got redone this year with new potting soil, and I dumped all the old potting soil into these raised beds. So hopefully there's some extra good nutrition in there, or at least some nice soil. This far bed has got four eggplants. I have two that are an Italian variety called Rosa Blanca and two that are a Japanese long skinny variety. 
And then these are the kind of the household peppers. So these are mostly sweet peppers. I have carmen, some bell peppers called bullnose, a couple of shishitos, and some cubanelles. So those are the peppers that are in this bed. I have many, many more peppers as you'll see, but this is the, the household use bed. And then tucked over here in the corner, I have an extra nasturtium that isn't very happy right now. We'll see, need to get a little more water on that. This is all set up with a drip system, uh, but I don't love it. It works, but it's not as good as it could be. On this side of that same arch, I also have beans. These are a Romesco style green bean that is actually a yellow bean that I got some seeds from a cousin of mine who he brought them back from Italy. So that's gonna be fun. And then in here is provider, dragon tongue, Maxell, I think, is the other one from Johnny. So a mix of green beans in here. And then slightly further back, I have some soybeans. I haven't tried growing edamame in years. And so I'm going to give that another try. And I had these all very nicely spaced. And then one of the chickens got out and proceeded to scratch around in here and make a huge mess and dig up a bunch of the beans. So I lost a few. A few got displaced. And then I'm also struggling a little bit with slugs and birds in these beds. I have a lot of leaves that haven't completely broken down, as you can see. And then on the very far side here, I have herbs. This is called um, toothache plant, also called buzz flowers. And evidently they're a big thing in the high-end bars because they make your mouth numb. And so they incorporate them into drinks as kind of a fun thing. They make your mouth feel buzzy. Uh, a couple of summer savories there and there that are tiny and just starting to come up. So we'll see how those do. And I've got a little bit more space in here. A few more flowers, some nasturtium, some marigolds, and a couple in the middle of agapanthus, I think is this one, and then uh, a type of salvia over here. So we'll see how those do. Over here, I have nigella seed, is what these ferny little lovelies are. Um, and nigella is a, um, a type of seed that is used in Indian cooking, and it tastes very much like oregano from my experience from last year. This year, I'm trying to increase the amount that I have. This is a bread seed poppy, which is really a beautiful lavender flower when it blooms, and then a lemon verbena over there in the corner few more flowers here that I haven't found space yet for. I might plug those into some spots on the green stock. And then I, in the last minute, I threw in here some beets and some carrots that were really too late uh, and then covered them up so that they would sprout and then didn't think they, didn't realize how quickly they had sprouted. And the reality is I actually have a lot of them in here, but I'm not sure how many of them are going to completely survive. Although it's looking pretty good right now, just because this bed is kind of uneven and I really should have pulled the cardboard that I had over it off much earlier than I did. So I have a feeling that a lot of them are gonna conk out. Um, there are a few beets in here as well. Um, we'll see what happens. I should have done that much earlier. Sometimes you just don't quite get to things when you need to. This was the earliest bed that I planted and some of it's actually already finished. So this is a red Russian kale. It is my favorite kale for eating. Um, it does not store super well, but it is really, really flavorful. Lacanado kale, also called dinosaur kale. I have a couple of those in there as well. And then this is Swiss chard. My Swiss chard, along with my spinach, has been just hammered by leaf miners this year. And you can see this leaf is an example of what's happening here. And so I've started spraying the leaves with pyrethrins, hoping to knock back the population. They're very seasonal. And if I can get through the next month or so, I'll probably be over the worst of it. Um, but they can really devastate the plants. And you don't really want to eat the leaves because they're full of worms. Um, this is romaine lettuce coming along very nicely, really a lot of this is ready to be harvested, but it'll hold a little bit longer. And I've got a fridge full of lettuce right now. This is a really lovely butterhead. And I just came out today and picked almost all 
of this red leafy lettuce that was getting ready to, it was starting to elongate, so it was getting ready to go to seed, and I wanted to get it out of there. Um, that's always a problem with lettuce, is it comes on all at once, and then you have salad for way more than you have room for. I put another patty pan squash right here, waiting for that to come up. And I'm not quite sure what I'm going to do with the rest of this bed once these lettuces come out because I will have stuff that is, I've got room for. I've always got flowers that I can stick in places. This is a couple of onions from last year, storage onions that had sprouted. And I decided to throw them in here instead of, instead of just eating them or throwing them to the chickens. And what will happen is this is their second year, so they're going to send up a flower stalk and cross-pollinate with each other, and I'll be able to save seed from those and have seed for more storage onions next year. And then I have some peas along this little trellis here, and I may or may not be successful. I have a terrible time with peas. I never get the timing quite right, although they are, I see, just starting to bloom. So that's pretty exciting. This half is snap peas, and that half is shelling peas. I actually really love shelling peas. Some of them didn't come up. I had That's why I had room for those onions because the peas didn't come up on the far end. But they don't like heat and we get hot really fast here and so we'll see how they do. So that is what I call the perennial garden or the raised bed garden. And now we're gonna walk out to the big garden and see how we're doing out there. This is my nine by 12 Harbor Freight greenhouse. I have a whole blog post on this in terms of how we built it and how we reinforced it. I get a tremendous amount of use out of this in the spring. It's really an awesome uh, piece of farm infrastructure. And I've got it reinforced so it doesn't blow apart in the, in the winds. And I have a few things still in here, but it's almost empty. It was completely full, like every shelf on the top all the way around was full up to the brim. Um, at this point, I have these are turmerics that I'm trying my hand at growing, and I really only have one that has successfully sprouted. Well, two, but we'll see what happens. It's just an experiment. This is a maidenhair fern that I cut way back, and it's been through some hardship, but it's starting to come back. We'll see if I can get it to survive. At this point, this thing has died back and come back so many different times that I almost am completely over it, and if it doesn't make it, I'm not gonna be terribly sad. These are a few leeks that were a late season planting that still need to go in the ground that I don't have, I haven't quite gotten to that. A whole flat of different kinds of snapdragons. And I did just fertilize these. You can see this, this sad stripy yellow leaf. They were not happy. And so I just put some fish fertilizer on those. These are gonna get stuck all over, um, both in that perennial garden and out in the big garden, just tucking into different places. I love having those out there. Oh my goodness, the coleus got happy. These are coleus that I started really, really late from seed. And so I've been waiting for them to get big enough to plant out. And they're really starting to come along, which is great. And then this is some, I have an aloe vera that I've had. I can't remember how long I've had this plant, but I'm guessing going on at least 10 years. And it has lots and lots of babies. And I pull it apart and transplant out the babies. And they look like absolute garbage for a month or two. And then they all start to green up and they're just in the process. You can see this one in the back here. That one looks quite good. Eventually they will all look like this. So it's just, they're finally starting to come out of their shock of being moved, of going from inside to outside, to being in a greenhouse, to being in a lot stronger sunlight, but they're coming. That'll be fun. Here's a couple more of those toothache plants that I will plant out. They were a little small and so I was waiting to plant them. And then this is Scabiosa. Um, they are one of my very favorite summer wild, wildflowers and pin cushion plant is the other name for them, and those will probably go into that bed with those squash. A few thyme plants that I grew from seed. I did have all this sitting outside, and I put some fish fertilizer in here, and my dog decided that that was the most enticing smell he had ever had, and so he climbed up onto the bench and knocked the entire thing over, and so I moved it into here. I lost a few plants in the process, because he just beat the heck out of everything. This also obviously needed a little bit of fertilizer, and so that's why I put that in there. But it's a little worse for wear. And then this is my okra 
which has mostly been in a holding pattern for about the last couple of weeks because it really isn't warm enough yet for it. This one just germinated. This is Texas Hill okra. And then I have an Alabama red that has yet to make an appearance. So we'll see. And then this is Jing, which is a really pretty variety that I grew last year. I have lots of flowers and plants. This is a ginger, kind of in keeping with the turmeric. I'm trying growing my own ginger this year. Um, and this has actually been doing a little better than the turmeric in terms of growing. I've got some nice, um, I had some die off here, but I've also had some nice new sprouts coming. There's three new sprouts in that coming off of that main shoot. So that's kind of exciting. My beautiful columbine. This just lives here and comes back every year and then it shoots out babies all over the place and so I'm always transplanting them. Um, it took me forever to get seed to grow from this and now that I have it I'll never be without it. It's so gorgeous. Random pots of hollyhocks and alyssum. More snapdragons. These got started much earlier in the season. That one's getting ready to bloom. And then some store-bought alyssum. More salvia some petunias. That petunia wasn't supposed to be red, it was supposed to be purple, but it's glorious and I love it. More calendula coming. And then this is an, a stevia that I overwintered that I really need to trim back. It's definitely very leggy, but I managed to um, overwinter it in my bathroom and then bring it back out here and it survived. I've got quite a bit of Italian oregano in pots out here as well, which is another thing I bring in because it's too cold for it to overwinter here. And then this is lemon verbena that I also overwintered in my bathroom and it's doing really lovely right now. So that's been quite rewarding. This glorious rose bush. This is my kind of rose, very not fussy and the most beautiful flowers. It smells lovely, absolutely stunning. And it'll bloom now and then it'll bloom again, kind of late in the season, like September. But this is a very hardy plant and it has huge rose hips on it. And so if I ever wanna do things with rose hips, I have a very nice source of rose hips. This is a fig that I'm going to leave in a pot. It's gonna go into a bigger pot once it leaves out a little bit more. I have a couple of figs in the ground. They die completely back every year, which is super frustrating because it it's very hard to get fruit off of them when they die completely back like that. This is a pomegranate that's also going to go into a pot. I tried growing one here. It did really well and then it died over the winter. Some extra hollyhocks. Um, this was super dry this morning. It got a little dried out and so they are in the process of recovering. A couple of sage plants and then these are pawpaws. And the big one here, this one was a mail order. I'm determined to get a pawpaw fruit off of this farm if I can help it. And then these three, I actually grew from seed from some mail order seed. So that's pretty fun. These guys, I'm gonna grow up for a full year, leave them in the pot that they're in before I plant them out. Um, Cause they're kind of precious and it takes a while to get them established. This one's gonna go in the ground here in about a week. And then just a few random things that um, I had for sale that haven't sold that I need to find homes for or toss in the ground someplace. This is a really interesting Pakistan style um, chive or leek. They call it a wild leek. It's really more like a chive, um, but I'm kind of excited to see what that's going to become. A few extra mint plants. You know, if you're a plant person, basically you can't stand to see anything go to waste and you throw everything in a pot. <laughs> These are four o'clocks that were really gorgeous last year that I um, just allowed to reseed and so I've got a bunch of seed coming up there and then this is my one rosemary plant that I also overwintered in the house and then in the pot accidentally was a volunteer nicotina and these smell amazing um, and they bloom in the evening and so they're really a fun plant. They smell so good this time of year. Um, so I just saw it was in there and I just left it in there. So yeah, rosemary. I use a ton of rosemary in a lot of different spice mixes that I make. And so I'm hoping to actually take some cuttings off of this and start some additional plants. And I'm watching the big box stores for rosemary to go on sale so I can pick up five or six more really cheap. This is a volunteer feverfew, just starting to bloom. 
Um, these guys will reseed really easily. And I, at one point, had some fever few for sale. And clearly, one of them went to seed, and that was the end of that. So now I have extra fever few around. This is Munstead Lavender, just getting going. And then I actually have three additional lavender plants over here around this little beech tree. And so I forget the varieties, but there's three different ones here. Oh, that one's just started to bloom. Look how pretty that is. And those are in, those are first year on those guys, so they'll get bigger as the year goes on. They should all be winter hardy. So that's the greenhouse. Welcome to the big garden. This consists of 16 or 1700 foot rows. Everything is watered by drip irrigation drip lines. Sorry for the sun in your eyes there. And we'll just walk around and take a gander at how things are looking. This is a production garden and it is not neat as a pin because I don't have that kind of time. There is no way that I could keep space this size perfectly manicured and still have time for anything else in my life. And so I just try to keep the weeds beat back so that they're not competing massively with what I'm trying to grow and call it good. So this is the tomato row. The first four plants here are tomatillos. If you haven't heard, tomatillos require at least two in order to create actual fruit. And as you can see, we're starting to get some little husks here. These are always the first thing to produce in the garden. And then the next nine or 11, I can't remember the total numbers. I think it's nine plus three of these tomatoes are cherry tomatoes. And so each one is a different variety. I can't tell you the names because the names are on the other side. And if I film from the other side, the sun's gonna be in your face. But I'm trialing a whole bunch of new red ones this year. And then just a variety of stuff that I've grown in the past and really loved. So they're doing quite well. I think every single one of them has fruit set. You can see there's a nice little cluster right there. A lot of people will pinch off their first flowers on their tomatoes in order to force the plant to do more root growth. But we have a nice growing season here and I really love getting that early, early flush of tomatoes. And so I don't pinch anything off for the most part. I trim off lower leaves. This paper at the bottom, this is an experiment this year. I had a bunch of paper feed bags. And so I'm using them as mulch around the base of the plant to try to discourage weeds. And I'm about halfway through the process of installing all of that. So it's gonna take a little while. I just bought these clips that you can see there on Amazon. It's a new type of tomato clip. I don't love them. They're not bad, but they're not as great as I was hoping. And once these get a little bit bigger, they will fill out this whole tomato cage and I really don't need to stake them anymore because the tomato cage just fills up with plant. But early in the season, it's always a challenge to keep everything up and off the ground. Look at all the fruit set on this. So I've got tomatoes here. I've got a beautiful cluster of them down there. And then a whole nother one down there. So yeah, lots and lots of tomatoes on that one. Again, most of these along the beginning part of this row are all various kinds of cherry tomatoes. I know what this one is because this is a potato leaf variety from a wild cross that I am growing out. And then I think these guys are Principice. So this is Principice. This is a cherry tomato, but it's a little bigger than a cherry. It actually is more like a salad tomato and they have these little nipples on the bottom. And in Italy, they're cut in half and dried. And I do that with quite a few of them. They make a lovely dried tomato, but they're a very nice eating tomato as well. So I have a couple of those, and then I have one called Chocolate Sprinkles that looks a lot like a Principice. It has that same nipple at the bottom, um, but they are dark purple striped. 
that's what this one is. So that's gonna be a lot of fun as that starts to come in. It will probably be mid-July. I don't know, I might get some early ones, we'll see. But usually I don't start getting any tomatoes to speak of until mid-July around here. And then, so that's the end of all of the cherries. And then everything from here on down are slicers of one kind or another. I do kind of mid-range slicers. My three favorites are Canner Hole, which is a seed saver exchange variety, uh, Mortgage Lifter, and Brandywine. These two are Brandywine. I recognize them because they have the potato leaf shape. So I have two of each of those because I do a lot of drying of those and selling them dried. And then everything from there on down is bigger slicers. So I've got Paul Robeson, Dr. Waichi, various others. I don't remember the names of everything right off the top of my head. And you can see why I need to mulch. Look at the weeds coming in down there. Oh my God, that's horrifying. Um, again, I'm just trying to keep the weeds beat back long enough for the plant to have time to do what it needs to do. But lots of flowers, lots of good growth. So we are past the window of fear at this point. And then the last six, starting with this one. So the last six here are paste tomatoes, two different varieties of San Marzano's. And so that's gonna be what I use mostly for canning and salsa this year. That'll be fun. One of the San Marzano's is from Johnny's. It's a new variety I'm trialing this year. And the other one is called San Marzano Redorta, which I've been growing for years, but I could not get new seed from this year. I'm not gonna go down the entire row on these, but I have two full rows of peppers. So 200 feet of peppers, and they're not full rows. They're almost, they're probably 75 feet each. Um, and this is everything from Poblano to the Hatch style New Mexico chilies to a bunch of different jalapeno varieties and some Aleppo's and a lot of paprika peppers that I dry. And in between each variety, when it changes from one to another, I have a flower planted. And that way it's very easy to see where I shift from one thing to another. So you can see over on this row, there's a flower right there on the left. Um, so I only have a few of these in the front. This is my potato row with a, a dog bomb photo bomb there. Um, my potatoes are doing really, really well this year with the exception of one type. The uh, Kennebec, I think, is the one that I did not get great um, emergence on. And so I've only got three or four of those plants, but everything else is doing very, very well. I'm very excited about this this year. We really need to get this mulched and that's on the list of things to do. We still have a pile of leaf mulch from last fall. Charlie, no, come here, go around. He's gonna go right through the middle of that row. Um, we need to get that mulched, but that's not on fire just yet, it's coming. This is the brassica row. And the brassicas and the peppers and the tomatoes, those were all composted with chicken manure at the beginning of the season. I don't have enough compost to do the entire garden every year. And so I selectively put it where I most need it. I have four different kinds of broccoli in here this year. There's, um, two that I can't get seed for anymore, Bay Meadows and Arcadia, and then two new ones that I'm trialing because I know I'm not gonna be able to get seed for those other two, and so I'm trying to see which ones are doing best. They are not heading up yet, but they are doing quite well. Some are a little smaller than others, but in general, they're great. And this is a great example of spacing. Once these plants get to a certain size, they are gonna outcompete any weeds that are coming up in between. And so I, this drip irrigation has holes every eight inches and I plant these brassicas every 16 inches. And so um, I can just see where the, the slit is on the line and it makes it very easy to put, put them in the ground without having to get a tape measure out. And as they get larger, they start out competing. Again, flowers in between. So this is a couple of hollyhocks. And then we move on to cabbages. I'm trialing three different varieties of cabbages this year. Some are doing better than others, and this one, for whatever reason, has clearly gotten a lot of slug damage. I have to put a lot of slug bait down on the brassicas early in the season or the slugs just decimate them. But there's, there's six of each kind here, and so one, 
one, two, three, four, five, six, and then I switch and you can clearly see that this variety is not doing as well as that variety is doing. And so that's the kind of information that it's worth growing multiple different types of seed to in, or in order to find out what works for your growing season. And it isn't that this is a bad variety, it just isn't working well here. Um, and so I'm not even going to bother telling you what it is because it's not working for me here, but it might be great for you wherever you are. And then this, this is a third variety, um, which is doing a bit slightly behind where the first one was, but not as far behind as these are. So it'll be interesting to see how those produce. Um, again, this one very, very chewed on. I probably need to start its slugs, but it's also... Um, cabbage moths and so it's probably about time to start spraying some BT out here. Again a hollyhock to mark the change. I have a few kohlrabi just for my own personal use just fun and you can see if you get down in there and look see the damage on that that's from slugs and the reason this is split that's from slugs and so they're very hard to grow for commercial use because the slugs get in there and scrape on the plants when they're really small, and then that scarring shows up. This is a very small patch of Chinese cabbage, and it is just starting to head up. I was just noticing this today. So that's exciting. That'll be delicious in some stir fries. This is a really fast. I planted these in order that they will come back out, and so these will come out first, these two, the Chinese cabbage and the kohlrabi. They're a one and done kind of thing, um, and then the cabbage will probably come out and then the broccoli will be last because I'll be getting a main harvest and then some side shoots on that. So I'll, I'll harvest them backwards in the order that they'll come back out. Another flower to mark a change. Lovely nasturtium. I believe this is peach melba. She's just gorgeous. A few ground cherries that are not so ground right now, although they are sprouting around the base. Um, they got really leggy in my greenhouse and so they're very tall, which is unusual for them another flower. And then these were just extra cabbage that I had that I planted out because I wasn't going to sell them. And so I just threw them in the ground. And so they're a little bit behind. The seed was planted at the same time as the others, but these were in pots longer. And so they're a little bit more stunted. We'll see if I get a crop out of those, but it was worth just throwing them in the ground. And then extra room on this row ended up being basil. So lots of basil. And I dry a lot of basil for various things and I make pestos and freeze them and then sell them in the winter. And then a couple of volunteer sunflowers that I'm just leaving for shade because it's fun. I have volunteer calendula coming up here as well. This is gorgeous. This is a uh, basically a type of baby's breath that I'm using as a marker as well this year at the end of this potato row. Tail end of the pepper rows. I have dill, and these have only been in the ground for less than a week. They were in pots, and so they're a little bit stunted, but they're starting to come out of it. Um, some Thai basil, another flower, and then this is a couple of cucumbers and a Kajari melon that I got free seed from at a seed swap. And then on the other side of this trellis is a different variety of cucumber and there's two or three plants in each one of those clumps and then another Kajari melon. So that'll be really pretty as those cover this trellis. I've never had the Kajaris. I've heard mixed things. So it'll be fun to give those a try. And they're a small enough melon that they should trellis without any real problems. This is what I refer to as my sunflower row. It's my pollinator row and my bird row, and it's kind of right in the middle of the garden. And the whole idea here is that it brings in the pollinators um, and it brings in the good bugs. And I honestly, I only actually plant this out with sunflower seeds about once every three or four years because there's so much seed in the ground because this has been here for so long that they just reseed all by themselves. And then this is something I'm really noticing a lot this year. Can you guys see? the ladybugs on there. I don't know what it is about sunflowers and ladybugs. I had some volunteers that I had to pull out the other day and every one of them that I pulled out had a ladybug in the center of it. 
So there's something, and they don't particularly appear to be buggy. I don't think there's a lot of insects in there. Um, but there's something about sunflowers that ladybugs really like. And so that's just really cool. Here's another one tucked into that one. They seem to be mating. Sorry, couple, that was rude. Here's another one. So yeah, lots of ladybugs in here, which again, that's the whole point of this row. Ooh, that's gonna be a very short little sunflower. That one's just already starting to head up. And there's weeds down underneath this, mostly lamb's quarter, which is harvestable, and I'm gonna do a video on that in a couple of weeks. But mostly the sunflowers get big enough, fast enough, that the weeds that are underneath are not really a huge issue. This row on the opposite side of the sunflowers, this is my beans this year. And there's not a whole lot to see yet. They're just starting to emerge. And then unfortunately I have a whole bunch of um, morning glory that I let go last year. And so there's a ton of morning glory seed volunteering in here as well. But I have cannellini beans just starting to emerge, a lot of black beans, and then some tiger's eye beans. A few more of the edamame are out here. So this is all gonna be beans. Look at all the, good Lord, look at all the morning glory seed coming up in here. That's gonna take a couple of minutes to go through and pull all of those out. That's crazy. Um, once you plant it once, you never not have it. It's very pretty when it blooms, but good grief. This is sweet corn. And I alternate years between a sweet corn, a flower corn, and a polenta corn. And this is a sweet corn year. Um, you have to spray sweet corn in our area or it gets really buggy with corn earworm. You can see those guys are looking really good. Um, and I did have my husband help me out the other day and went through and kind of tucked some new seeds into the ground in some places where I didn't have great germination. And you can also see the tremendous amount of weeds that are in here. And so I need to get out here like tomorrow and put a... a stirrup hoe to this and try to at least knock back some of that grass or we're going to have a huge problem because there's there's a lot more grass than there is corn right now um, this also got compost this is the other row that always gets compost is the corn row this is melons and they're planted every five or six feet in a group of two or three mostly a variety of cantaloupe called hannah's choice which I absolutely love. And I love cantaloupe because you know when they're ripe because they slip off the vine. And then at the very end is a different variety that's a Israeli green type cantaloupe that I also really love. I've got three rows here of onions and also a tremendous number of weeds. Try to look away. I'm gonna think of some new strategies next year on this. Um, and I'll put a quick video here of my husband and I planting all of these out a couple of weeks ago. They're just starting to really fully recover from all of that trauma of being planted, but they're looking really good. And again, a flower in between each variety. And so I'm changing from one variety to another variety and I'm marking it with a calendula flower, which is really fun. I have a little bit of a strip at the end of this row that I just planted a bunch more cilantro in. It's very late to be planting cilantro. I'm expecting it to bolt, um, but I really just want it for the seed. And so I'm looking for seed production with this. And I very heavily planted it because it was really old seed. So we'll see what we get, if anything. It was definitely very late in the season to be doing that. This row is a mess of weeds right now. I did have a lot of reseeded chamomile in here amongst the grass. And then there's some perennial uh, herbs that I had in here last year, some of which survived. So this is a zatar that managed to survive. This is a volunteer flax, which is lovely. It's just doing its thing. And a sunflower, here's another zatar. Um, so there's a few things in here, but this giant mound of dirt right here is the gophers that got in here um, and did a job on everything. We have a volunteer poppy. So this is kind of the surprise row. I think of it as a perennial row where I don't actually till it up every year. This is Feverfew. 
Um, but mostly it's just a giant weedy mess because I haven't had time to get in here. This is Morphe Refue. This is um, Jerusalem Artichoke, which there's a bed of that kind of interspersed in here that comes and goes. And the gophers rearrange it every year. So that's a bit of an interesting challenge. This is some oregano that I'll be harvesting soon that overwintered. There's another one here. There's a few more back in there. I have kind of weeded slightly in here just to keep these guys from being completely buried. More of the Jerusalem artichoke. And then rhubarb. And I picked, I pruned back a lot of these. Isn't that pretty with the sun behind it? I picked a lot of the, cut a lot of the flower stalks off, but boy, when they want to go to flower, they really want to go to flower. And so they just keep fighting you. And sometimes I get volunteer rhubarb plants out here, which is lovely, and I just transplant them. So I don't completely fight that off. I've harvested quite a bit off of here, um, and I could probably do a few more harvests, but I don't really, since I'm not making jam anymore, I don't have quite as much of a use for it as I used to. Um, so I'm just kind of letting it do its thing. Here is a volunteer rhubarb that I dug up and transplanted into this spot. And it's not super happy right now, but it'll be fine and survive and it'll be good next year. This was all basil last year and this is just a giant weedy mess right now. There's hardly anything in here. I think I did see a fennel. Um, this is a, a volunteer uh, Coreopsis that I've grown many times that is really lovely. And so I'm hoping that manages to survive. And then this is some anise hyssop, which makes a really great tea. And that's a perennial. There's a perennial um, horseradish in here, kind of buried in the weeds. And then a few uh, Egyptian walking onions that are also buried in the grass. And once, if we get a good rain where the soil is really nice and damp everywhere, I will go through here and weed this really well. But because I'm not actively trying to grow much in here this year on this particular row, I'm not worried about it. It's just something I don't have a lot of time for. And then we have three rows of garlic. And you'll see a lot of gaps out here. This is a good example where you see a couple of garlic and then there's nothing. And then you see a couple more garlic and then there's almost nothing. That was gopher activity over the winter time. So unfortunately, the gophers ate a lot of garlic. Some rows look way better than others. This one is looking pretty good. This is all one variety. And then this row is all one variety. Um, so that's, I have a lot, I have a hundred foot row of each of those two varieties and they're okay. It, it's not such a crisis when you lose some of that to the gophers because you've got a lot of it. But this one, like for whatever reason, they were fine here. And then this variety right here, which was a Thai purple. This was Thai purple. I mail ordered the plants. I only got a small, you know, probably a pound of it. I have one plant. They completely ate every Thai purple I had. And then the same thing here. This was Chinook Red. I have one, two Chinook Reds. The gophers ate the rest. Wildly frustrating when you don't have a lot of something and then they come in and eat everything. I did have a lot of volunteer poppies, most of which I just mowed, but I did dig a few up and just moved them around when I could. And so this is, I had a space here. And so how pretty is that? I love having flowers in the garden. Here's an example of the gopher. You can see how this is just yellowed and pulled into the ground. And if I pull on that, the end of it's been just eaten completely off. I always joke that my gophers have the worst breath in the neighborhood because they're always eating my garlic and my onions. But yeah, super frustrating. There's a few more poppies. There's a few more poppies along the edge that I just let go. I didn't row and run over with the mower because I was like, you guys are so pretty and you're in a good spot. This first row is the one that had the different kinds of, of garlic in it. And so I have a lot more garlic in here in terms of varieties than the other two rows. And then the very end of this row is elephant garlic, which I've never grown before. And I was inspired by Becky at Acre Homestead she grows it and powders a lot of it and uses it as a garlic powder. She's very heavy handed with her spices. And then when I saw that she was using 
elephant garlic, I was like, oh, that's why she's so heavy handed because that doesn't have nearly the strength of flavor as the other kinds. But I thought it would be fun to try growing it. And you know, once you have it, you can keep it going. And so hopefully that'll be a successful crop. Um, I did lose a few of those to gophers, but at least some of them are still here. This was filling in a hole. These are kohlrabis because I didn't have anything at the end of this because the gophers ate it. And then last but not least, the one row out here that's the one thing that isn't fully planted out, this is gonna be sorghum. And so I am getting ready tomorrow to plant this with a wheel planter with sorghum, which will, will actually take me that long. And then we're gonna have a nice stand of sorghum here for syrup. And I'm gonna buy an actual cane press this year so that I can make that much more efficiently. So that's gonna be a lot of fun. This is Marion berries, which we are not, we're a little bit too cold for them. So we tend to get a lot of winter kill. You can see I lost the ends of a lot of things. My husband helped me clean up this giant mess a month or so ago, but I am getting some really lovely blooms. So hopefully we'll get some good fruit off of this this year. We'll see. Um, this one in particular, this plant has a lot of flowers on it. They bloom on second year growth. And so the idea is to have second year growth on this upper trellis and then this first year growth that's now currently snaking along the ground, that's to get tied up to this lower trellis. And then at the end of the year, you cut off the old growth and then move the newer growth up to this top trellis so that you can keep that cycle going. And it's supposed to make harvesting a lot easier, but it's a big job. These things are wildly thorny. You can see the crazy thorns on that. And so working with them is just a nightmare. And then what keeps happening is we keep getting cold winters and I'm losing a lot of the ends of that second year growth. And so I'm really just not getting the fruit set off of this that I would like. These plants have been in the ground long enough that I should be getting a way bigger crop than I actually am. But, you know, they're in at this point, so we just keep piddling around with it until I figure out what else I wanna do instead. So that is the garden as of the 1st of June, 2023. So we'll try to revisit this once a month and we'll see how things are looking. Thanks for watching, Tribe. Join me on the next video where I show you what I do with all the produce that I grow.